Welcome to Statistically Insignificant, a voiceover with visual elements about statistics in everyday life. My name is Tess, my pronouns are she and they, and I will be droning on at you about valid measurement for as long as you can tolerate it. With me is Bart. How's it going, Bart? I'm good. My pronouns are he and him. I don't drone on about anything. <laughs> That's right. Today we're talking about anecdotal data. My first degree was in sociology, and it's been a source of immense frustration for me since to see the way that particularly arrogant people from the physical sciences talk about social science in general. Research in social science gets dismissed as being too subjective and not real enough. The reality is that systems with social interactions are so phenomenally complex in comparison to what physicists or whatever deal with that you just can't use the kind of methods that the physical sciences do. Imagine for me if you could reasonably expect that two people were interchangeable aside from a single feature. An awful lot of physics is based on the assumption that's pretty reasonable, I reckon, that you can do that with things like electrons. Lucky bastards. When you deal with people, you have to address what they experience from their own perspective. This is why social science research talks to people, which I have seen referred to as glorified anecdotal data by detractors. So as an extended middle digit to that STEM lord in particular, we're going to talk about how you deal with making research about human experience more rigorous. Firstly, we're going to look at some features of what good research should do that uses those first-hand accounts. Then we're going to look at some examples, the good, the breathtakingly bad, and the weird. This episode is going to feature some discussion of domestic violence, sexual violence, mental illness, and cancer, so consider that a content warning for all of those things. For the purpose of this podcast, what I mean by anecdote is someone telling you about themselves and what they have experienced. This doesn't cover like secondhand accounts, though they do show up. I mean, history has to deal with how do you make secondhand accounts rigorous all the time, and they have good ways to be sufficiently careful and paranoid about those. There are a couple of main principles that we're going to look at. The first is that people are experts in their own experience. God, I'm not. <laughs> okay, but who better? <laughs> If you want to know how somebody found it to live through something, you need to respect that they are the person that did, and their account of it reflects all of these subjective features of being in there. The richness, the interest in a lot of social science is looking at how there are both radical differences between what people experience, even if quote-unquote objectively it was the same event, as well as seeing where there are parallels and connections between quite radically different experiences as well. To get at that, you have to have people tell you about them, because this is stuff you can't measure any other way. The second principle is that people may not be willing to tell you what they have experienced. One of the most challenging parts of using interviews for research, or being a participant in order to understand something, is that it takes a really high level of trust for participants to give you an honest and complete answer. If someone thinks that you're judging them, even that you pity them rather than feel solidarity or empathy, or for some reason think that you're going to use the information to harm them, they're not going to give you the whole answer. They are going to give you what they think you want to hear, or some modified version of what they actually experienced that they think will align to their interests and your expectations. There is a true art to establishing rapport in interviews, and a significant ethical obligation to ensure that people who tell you stuff aren't screwed over by that in the future. There's also a balancing act to not encourage embellishment of the truth, right? Because people want to make other people happy in general. So there is a, an incentive structure to telling a researcher what they want to hear, which is hard to get around. It's one of the justifications used in psychology research for lying to participants about what they're actually doing. On the other hand, it's really quite amazing how much incredibly illegal and potentially quite damaging stuff people will say to you if you, like, are an interview person, particularly if you guarantee their own anonymity. Uh, this is doubly the case for, like, the stuff you do anonymously online. You'd be amazed what people will say. I'm amazed what people will say under their own names online, to be fair. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck, yeah. <laughs> so, third, a person's recollection of their experience may not be a complete or accurate account of what happened. This one is genuinely kind of dangerous, because it's quite easy to fall into disbelieving people, particularly if what they are saying doesn't fit your ideology. 
if you are looking at accounts of events, the general principle is trust but verify as a reasonable standard. But even there, things can get really difficult. Research into abuse is particularly tough on this front because abusers are greatly incentivized to minimize their responsibility and their harm that they have done, even to themselves. And it's extremely common for abusers to position themselves as victims in some way in their own accounts of what happened, even if they were the ones committing violence. Absolutely. The interaction of unreliable recollection with the potential unwillingness to tell you the whole story does produce a very real minefield. An interesting counterpoint to that is stuff like hallucination, whether due to drugs or mental illness. People can be quite aware that what they're seeing or hearing isn't real, but they do still experience it. And their accounts of those things are not about the physical reality outside their own head. Mm -hmm. This page, to summarize, is doing science on Kurosawa mode. <laughs> In light of this, there are some things that anecdata are valid for, and others they are not. I wouldn't ask somebody to eyeball the amount of water in a lake, but I would ask them if they are experiencing pain or nausea. We will be looking at three case studies, which I'm going to call the good, the bad, and the weird. The first, the good, come courtesy of Josie Spicer of A Hill to Die On podcast, and are a couple of papers from criminology research. Our first paper is a 2021 report from Richard's death, sick name, <laughs> and Ronkin. <laughs> Death and Ronkin. I know, right? It's like death and taxes. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a report on interviews with victim survivors of sexual violence, which were aimed at understanding their perspectives on a offender rehabilitation support program. The program is called Circles of Support and Accountability, or COSA. And basically what happened is they got a bunch of people in, told them about it, and asked them what they thought of it. How the program works is that when somebody who was imprisoned for sexual violence gets out, they have a period of regular contact with a group of trained volunteers to provide support in the transition out of prison, as well as some level of surveillance, because honestly, that's part of its purpose. The meetings are weekly to start with, then less frequent over time. This paper wanted to inve investigate what victim survivors think of such a program because they are members of the community that offenders return to and are often the most directly affected by offenders. This study was uh, actually done in Australia. The second paper from Josie is investigating how people experienced dealing with the police when the cops get called to domestic incidents which are verbal rather than physical. So it's a 2013 paper by Stuart... Langen and Hannum. Uh, this one's based in Canada. In these situations, it can be a little bit fraught because it may have been the victim, perpetrator, or a neighbor who actually called the cops. And there is some evidence that these different situations lead to different experiences for the people involved. In both instances, the participants self-identified on some level, at least. For the Australian paper, participants were reached via a fa the Facebook page for an Australian organisation which provides child protection support. So the page posted an invitation to victim survivors of sexual violence to participate in the study. In the second paper, participants were reached through a pilot program in Ontario being run with a victim service organisation. People were directed to that organization by police if they had been involved in a non-criminal, verbally aggressive domestic incident. So these are specifically non-criminal because at the time Canada didn't have explicit laws for that kind of abuse being a criminal act. The researchers in the Canadian paper allowed the participants to choose the language used to position themselves in their experience and only identified them as victim survivors if the participant used that kind of terminology. So um, I'm going to tend to use participant rather than victim survivor for a lot of this precisely because of that sort of structure. Yep. The self-identification as either a victim survivor or of abuse or if somebody wanted to be engaged with this sort of study, is a kind of anecdotal data because you are taking what people say about themselves to be authoritative. Neither paper went and sought verification for, for participant claims because that's not the point of them. They are looking to what people say about themselves. This is a very different threshold of evidence than, for example, a conviction in court. This research is not looking to lock someone up or institute reparations to a victim, and it is very conscious of the fact that conviction rates for sexual violence are low in comparison to reported incidents, sorry, sexual or domestic violence. 
This doesn't mean that those incidents don't occur, but instead, the threshold of evidence required for a conviction is very, very high. The evidence of someone saying that they have experienced sexual or domestic violence is not on its own considered sufficient in the justice system. When we are dealing with like criminology research around these sorts of topics, there's some criticism that comes out mostly from men's rights groups, let's be perfectly honest, <laughs> basically saying, oh, how can you trust these people to actually be victims when they say they are? Well, the answer is that's not what you're trying to do. It is interesting that in the first program, it's volunteer labor that uh, goes into uh, circles of support and accountability. Yeah, so this is, um, so I don't know how much the Canadian organization that does the second program is volunteer. Uh, in the first one, yeah, so this is a fairly common thing among these sorts of community services because, frankly, governments aren't willing to pay people to do the work mm -hmm. because it's care work and care work doesn't count, right? <laughs> so interestingly, they actually found that among the volunteers, there was a fairly high rate, I think about 25% or something, of people who had themselves experienced some form of sexual violence. Yep. It seems like a lot of the, the volunteers going into this sort of thing saw it as a way of kind of reducing future offending. And they came to that with that explicit sort of idea. Right. They were not interviewed for this for this particular paper. I want to make that clear. The different threshold of evidence also relates to the sorts of questions being asked by the researchers. These studies are not looking for a recount of events, although particular events do come up at times. They are investigating what people say about their experience, their perspectives and opinions, not whether something happened or not. The actual research methodology for both is to use semi-structured interviews to collect data, then do thematic analysis. For people who haven't dabbled in social science, a semi-structured interview is one where you have basically a list of questions that act as a guide for the sorts of things that you talk about. They don't define a rigid structure for the interview, they don't restrict your ability to say, actually, I, I think that this person wants to say more to me about this, so I'm going to ask other questions that probe more into a particular thing because it's relevant. This is particularly useful when dealing with the huge diversity of examples of sexual and domestic violence, because there is no one-size-fits-all system to do that. Thematic analysis involves researchers going through typically like transcripts or recordings of what has been said, and then tagging recurring themes or ideas or narratives to see what shows up repeatedly. There are actually ways to verify that the meaning being tagged by a particular researcher is reasonable. What you typically do is have multiple people do the analysis in whole or in part, do it independently, and then compare what they find to see if it's consistent. At the point of comparison, you may have some refinements, like you might have two themes picked up by different people, which are basically different ways of wording the same thing. So there's there can be a process of kind of combining and validating that those are actually the same idea underlying. The papers actually turned out different sorts of results. The second paper was a bit more traditional among qualitative research in that it was able to identify repeated themes among the accounts, such as that people called the police because they were scared in the instances where they were the ones to do so, or because they had reached a point where they felt the need to assert themselves against the behaviour and perceived the cops as one tool to do so. Mm -hmm. Where a participant was asked to recall specific events, it was stuff like whether they were the one to contact the police and whether they were asked to leave the property or arrested alongside the other party. The other sorts of questions were like, did you have a positive interaction with the police? Did you feel supported or um, like you had agency or this sort of thing? Were your goals in trying to access that support met? As in, did the bad behavior stop? That sort of other thing is also asked. The first paper, on the other hand, had a much harder time finding consistent themes because the participants' perspectives actually changed over the course of the interview or were self-contradictory. In that study, the, the way that it was set up was that people were asked a bunch of questions about their experience of sexual violence, then told about the COSA program and asked their opinion on what it 
could do what it should do, whether it would be effective or not. Given that the program was entirely new to the participants, as far as I can tell, it's not really surprising that they haven't worked out what they think of it immediately, because it's a, it's a huge complex issue, right? Mm -hmm. The interview process was probably part of the participants working out what their opinion was. But that's not really something that fits well into a traditional thematic analysis framework, because you can't pick out a theme in the sense of a particular opinion that a person has, because it's changing over the course of the interview. Instead, the researchers looked at the explanations given for those opinions at any particular point in time. For example, a person who initially expresses skepticism of the program may do so because they don't believe it would reduce reoffending, but that could change as a, like to be later support on the same basis in the sense that they have determined that it might reduce that reoffending. The underlying explanation there is that the participant doesn't want this person to do more harm. So their support for or opposition to a given program is conditioned on their perception of how effective it will be. That sort of risk management perspective that and, and risk management approach to these programs is an explanation for opinions, even if the opinions themselves are inconsistent over time. So are people brought back in to answer the similar questions over the time of the of the project? This particular project was kind of a, a one-off survey to see what you could get in the context of these programs being run, I think, South Australia. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there was follow-up. This was published last year and the interviews were, I think, about a year before. So it may well be that follow-up is going on and they haven't released the research on it. Unfortunately, this stuff takes a lot of time. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. So one of the interesting features of the kind of population in this study was that only some of them had actually experienced the person who had committed the offence against them going to jail and then being released. Uh, this isn't necessarily surprising because the conviction rates for sexual violence are really quite low. And also, when people do go to prison, if they're there for a long time, the, the their um, like victim survivor may not have had them come out again afterwards. So a lot of this was basically asking for kind of broader opinions of people who may or may not have the person who committed the offence against them in this sort of environment, but asking what their perspectives is as experts in kind of living the experience of being victim survivors. Right. So these papers are a good use of anecdotal data because they use it as evidence for what people experience and their perception, and because they're consistent in their efforts to interpret those. The interviews are getting at something that you can't really access any other way, precisely because it's about what's going on in people's heads. And that is like one of the particularly good uses of anecdotal data in this format, is that you can get at things that you can't measure from a kind of quote-unquote objective standpoint. Mm -hmm. I have some opinions about the notion of objective measurements in science too. <laughs> Physical sciences. We have another pair of examples in the bad. While we've just seen a bunch of qualitative research, now we're going to take talk about quantitative data for a second. Newspaper and like magazine articles reporting on how much rich people say they are worth. <laughs> yeah. Yes. This is almost always anecdotal. They ask somebody who is rich to estimate just how rich they are, and it's usually a rounded figure with millions or billions attached and a lot of vibes. Of course, it's also a marketing tool for a lot of them. An awful lot of wealth for rich people gets obfuscated through things like valuations for art in private collections. So if you don't know, the whole like fine art industry for the very wealthy is basically a huge tax dodge. So what you do is you have your artwork, you get somebody to come in and say, oh yes, I value this at whatever, let's say $300,000. You can then donate that artwork to a charity or an organization and claim that donation back on tax. The the kind of, shall we say, contemporary art world has done an awful lot of this. I mean, I, I suspect that NFTs, if they were properly taxed, would basically be the same thing. So it's a, an awful lot of, I want to protect my wealth that is actually tied up in other things with a more, um, shall we say, rigorous uh, monetary value. So I'll use this thing where I can more or less define the monetary value however I want, 
and leverage that as a tax dodge. Another great thing you can do is get someone to value your art really low, pass it on to your kids as uh, as inheritance, and then they can come back to that art of value who then value it as, as really high. Yeah, yeah. It's a great way to get around like if you have any kind of inheritance tax. Donald Trump has a particularly amusing, I guess, history of doing this. So he has had and sought out himself, in fact, an awful lot of magazine articles that trumpet how wealthy he is. And he has also got a long history of um, vibes-based self-evaluation of wealth to, like, banks. And this may or may not come back to bite him in the arse in the near future if those are found to be fraudulent. Eh, he's not, he's not going to jail. Let's oh, not no, no, get no. too excited. Absolutely not. But it would be very <laughs> funny if he did. Once you prosecute one former president, that, like, uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, that becomes that opens, a- <laughs> Doesn't it just? <laughs> now I want to explore something with a bit more direct harm to people. The use of anecdotal data by cancer quacks to support their bullshit. I got exposed to this stuff when my partner's father was diagnosed with stage 4 stomach cancer in 2016. His original oncologist was a condescending asshole who didn't answer questions, give explanations, or really give the guy any sense of hope that they could even try anything. Unsurprisingly, Dean's dad went off the deep end a bit and started trying a whole bunch of wacky shit because he was desperate and willing to give literally anything a shot on the basis that, well, it might work. He had watched his fiance die from cancer about 18 months before, and she had also had a really shit time on chemo, so that was all, always in the back of his mind when he was doing this. What got him out of it was a combination of Dean's efforts to convince him that not only was it not supported by evidence, it was actually doing damage, and also watching himself waste away on the diet that was what he was being quote-unquote treated with. Part of Dean's effort involved me digging through as much of the research as I could get my hands on to provide an account of what, if any, evidence actually existed for the particular thing he had gotten into. I'll be focused on that quackery, which is called Gearson therapy, but similar tactics are extremely common across the whole industry. I would also say that the media loves playing this up as like a heroic act. Like when uh, Jim Steins died, they made a big deal about how he tried everything to kind of... uh, treat his cancer and like a lot of that was like a bunch of uwu bullshit that was never going to help yeah well it's i don't like it being positioned as brave but i can certainly understand it as desperate Mm. the reality is if you have been told by an oncologist basically i'm sorry there's nothing we can do for you you're going to die you will try other things and i i think that the people who do go and try that stuff out are are a lot more nuanced and complex in their approach to it than they are generally perceived to be, precisely because they can be sceptical of whether or not it works and still give it a try. Mm. So Gearson therapy is one of the many systems that claim diet as a treatment for serious disease, but it also comes along with a bunch of other stuff, like, I shit you not, coffee enemas. (laughs) Yeah, they can do, like, Diet's one thing. I mean, it has, like, there are cases of malnutrition that come out of this sort of thing. But coffee enemas can have, like, quite serious physiological consequences when you puncture your own bowel. So there's a whole bunch of other stuff going on as well. Basically, Gearson therapy is an extremely restrictive diet that claims to do stuff with toxins and enzymes that cure cancer and a whole host of other diseases as well. One of the things that actually made it somewhat intuitive and appealing to Dean's dad was that he would get really bad mouth ulcers and a very upset stomach if he ate the wrong things. So part of this was the cancer, right? Mm. The oncologist was telling him that his diet wouldn't affect his treatment, but it did very much affect his physical well-being. So another treatment which says, no, really, your diet matters, was immediately quite appealing. Yeah. When it comes to the use of anecdotal evidence for Gearson, that comes in a number of different forms. The primary one is the use of patient testimonials and marketing material. There's a clinic in Mexico which focuses on Gearson therapy. I think his daughter runs it or something. And they have a website with entire pages dedicated to these patient testimonials. Why Mexico and not the US, you might ask? Well, for some reason, they can't get FDA approval for this. Can't (laughs) imagine why. The problem here is that a patient testimonial is not actually reliable evidence. They're not verified at all. It's purely people talking about their experience. Where this runs into problems is things like people who were misdiagnosed and didn't actually have cancer at all. 
There's also no verification that the person answering your question is actually the patient or any kind of fact checking or that sort of thing. There are also people who were on a conventional treatment like chemo or radiation therapy and also doing some Gearson stuff who did see their cancer reduced but attribute it to Gearson and not whatever else they are doing. This is particularly difficult to deal with in cancer because the treatments make you feel like shit. The Basically, efforts to kill the patient slightly slower than the cancer for long enough to get rid of the cancer. Generally, if you come off chemo, you feel a shitload better, which people also often attribute to being on Gearson if they're doing it at the same time. Mm -hmm. The misattribution is really, really common, but the anecdotes talking about how much better they feel and all the rest of it, that can be quite true, as it is also not a full account of the whole story of what their physiology is doing. You can't rely on it as evidence for the efficacy of this treatment. There are also a lot of other methodological issues, I'm shocked, truly, <laughs> that overlap with the questionable data, including only talking to people who do well, which is a kind of biased sampling. <laughs> Sorry, I have to bitch about this now that I've started. I've been wanting to talk about this stuff for so fucking long. <laughs> the clinic claims something like an 80% success rate for their cancer patients. How they got that number is that Basically, they only count a failure as any case was where the clinic is notified of a death. So this could be the family contacting the clinic to say, hey, this person who came to you is near dead. Or if the clinic calls the patient after they leave and they get told by the person who answers that the patient is dead. Every other case is treated as success, including if they get no contact. This is a huge missing data issue and it's completely unacknowledged. That's not what they put in their quote-unquote research articles, but they use it in their marketing, right? They love to claim that they're the only clinic that has a cancer treatment, which is peer-reviewed. So there's a bunch of these sorts of things in that area in North Mexico. I think it's near Tijuana, right? The Gearson treatment actually has a published research article, except... It's published in a really shit quack journal of alternative medicine. It does a bunch of what we would call like selective subgrouping of people. So you take all of your patients and then you look at patients who have this one specific type of cancer and there's like 10 of them once you get down to that level. And so this subgrouping allows you to pick out effects, which on the whole would not look statistically significant or would not look like they have a huge impact. But when you're looking at six or 10 people, oh, now suddenly a 30% success rate looks reasonable, you know? Like it's, <laughs> it's so fucked up. And we've talked about on this podcast before the uh, kind of corruption around publishing in certain places. I'm sure if you're an alternative medicine person, that works to your advantage. So this is the thing, right? One of the big issues with the publication industry is that you can just invent your own journals. There is nothing stopping you from doing that. And in fact... It's not unheard of for somebody to create their own journal in order to publish it. You know, Alternative medicines and other things like that will do this with the explicit purpose of developing a veneer of, like, or respectability of objectivity and evidence-based medicine, because they know that that will help them get people. Whether or not they actually believe what they are doing is uh, somewhat of a separate question. They do a lot of harm regardless of whether or not they believe it. But they are more than happy to adopt the sort of veneer of peer review and all the rest of it in order to, like, get this stuff published. Absolutely. Oh, one other thing I have to talk about. Sorry. As I said, I have gotten started now, right? So <laughs> this particular clinic has just breathtakingly bad record keeping. So if you go to a proper cancer ward, they will have records for everything on a patient. So they'll track it really rigorously. They will have every scan the patient has ever done, every blood test, uh, like tracking what changes over time. They will have a very specific diagnosis for the particular cancer that the patient has because cancer is a physiological structure. It's not a single disease. So it's simply the structure whereby you have this uncontrolled cellular replication, right? Mm -hmm. The cause of that is the actual disease, and that is a huge variety of different things. Cancers that are caused by viruses, as well as cancers that are caused by something going wrong in the programming of the cell. Anyway, mm -hmm. this clinic 
doesn't track any of that stuff. They don't even necessarily track whether a patient actually has the cancer that they come in and say that they have. <laughs> what yeah. kind of cancer it is. They don't track scans or record like the size behavior of the cancer tumors or anything like that. It is perfectly set up to make evaluating the method extremely difficult because of fucking course it is. Yeah. I wanted to ask about cancer and dietary stuff. Like, for example, mm. if you get cancer, is there, like, value in quitting smoking? Like, after you've already been diagnosed? I don't know uh, is the short answer to that one. Um so the the only reason I know some stuff about the diet physiology in relation to cancer is because like Dean's dad specifically had stomach cancer, yeah. which um probably caused some of that relationship to what he was eating. But also when you're on chemo, it fucks up your di your your body and can really like make some eating some things intolerable. Absolutely. Yeah, there's this whole other section of stuff which is how your phys bodily physiology reacts to chemotherapy and the side effects of chemotherapy. I mean, look, medicine's getting better at it, but they're still not great at dealing with actual patient lived experience and well-being. And there's a reason that it's not uncommon for somebody who has like cancer reoccur later in life to just decide, I can't go through chemotherapy again. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, up until like the point where you have like organ failure as a result as a result of your cancer, chemotherapy could feel so much worse. Yeah. Dear listener, if you're a podcast fan and if you're watching this, this is like looking at the bottom of the baggie of podcasts, I would say. <laughs> For the subjective experience of going through real treatment with cancer, I really recommend the podcast Jesse versus Cancer, where it's just a guy who got uh, diagnosed with cancer in his late twenties talking Jesus. through all of his experiences with it. He, he's in remission now, but if you go back to the old episodes, you can really, uh, it's like an audio diary of having cancer. And it's a shit show. Every time it's a shit show, yeah. So what we have in these bad case studies for anecdotal evidence is that they are using anecdotes for things that can be verified in other more rigorous ways. In a lot of times, precisely because these other methods of verification don't show what the people want to claim. So you can measure whether a cancer tumor has grown or shrunk. You can check whether they are still present up to a certain level of resolution, right? And cancer is one of those things where a person from the outside, well, quote unquote outside, looking at their own body, they don't necessarily know what's going on on the inside. So like if you have something that is affecting your skin, you can see that in a way you can't directly observe cancer tumors. So that makes it a lot harder for a person to know and keep track of what's happening without scans and blood tests and all the rest. But lastly, we have the weird. I'm going to talk a bit about things like alien abductions and demonic possession. There is a long history of people having the sorts of experiences that now get att attributed to like alien inductions in places like the US, and demonic possession has been with us for a long time as an explanation for particular physiological things and particular experiences. I don't consider people relaying these experiences to be evidence of actual alien abductions, for example, but like people who make genuinely felt claims of having been demonically possessed, they do seem to be evidence of experience of something. I feel like this is similar for like accounts of hallucinations from drugs or something from a period of psychosis. These are very real experiences, but they are not experiences of reality. So somebody telling you about it doesn't really give you evidence that those things have happened in the physical world. Testimonies of people who claim to have been abducted by aliens are very popular among those who claim that aliens come and do that sort of thing, but they're not actually good evidence for it. As the uh, arts partisan here, <laughs> I would uh, I would like to talk about alien abductions and the like, um, cryptids, things like that, as actually a modern equivalent of mythology. Oh yeah. Like if you ever hear some like uh, some idiot online saying like oh Marvel movies or whatever are the new mythology. That's not quite true. What what is true is kind of like anecdotes that are sort of believed and sort of not in a kind of non-binary way that are kind of passed around in these kind of like storytelling things. So f things like alien abduction and things like that much more closely resemble what we would think about with uh, ancient mythology and that kind of thing than anything else, I would say. Yeah, so my understanding of how ancient mythologies worked is that they were a way of 
explaining phenomena in the world. And certainly no Marvel movie is an explanation for a phenomena in the world, right? Except maybe for like people buying incredible amounts of extremely stupid paraphernalia. But what your alien abduction does is it provides an explanation for something that you have experienced. Mm -hmm. Some really, really interesting research looking at the history of the different narratives that people tell themselves about those sorts of things. It was only after we had these ideas around aliens existing, what do they look like, how do they behave, that you got stories that kind of lined up with those sorts of things. I mean, prior to that, similar experiences would have been explained by fey behavior or demonic possession is obviously one of the things that sorts of shows up there mm -hmm. or interactions with demons and whatever like like meeting the devil in a crossroads is not unlike meeting an alien there in some level right yeah um th there's also an, uh, uh, in one of those john ronson books who's a journalist i don't necessarily trust so take it with a yeah a grain of salt perhaps <laughs> a grain of salt, yes. He mentions a specific psychological condition that when it was experienced in people in the deep south of America was thought of as the person like being overtaken by the devil. Yeah. But when it was experienced by like middle class people in London, it was like people who suddenly thought that they were racist and sexist. <laughs> it's just like okay. the, the cultural values that you take yeah. into it are like applied into your experience of this thing. Well, I find it quite interesting to look at what what used to be well what are now thought to be ex uh, accounts of having like autistic children there there are some theories that what used to be like the fairies coming along and replacing your child with one of theirs was actually a way of explaining Aut the on onset of autism or the the recognition of symptoms of like being on the autism spectrum because a lot of the descriptions of what these fey children, how they behaved, actually line up with like um, particular forms of autism and nonverbal autism in particular. Our explanations for these phenomena change over time as we understand them better, but the phenomena are still there. And mythology kind of forms the f one of the like ways of explaining and understanding it when you don't have other th ways to go about that. Absolutely. So the good research articles that we looked at here were a purely qualitative approach. So they had quotes and they had descriptions. They didn't actually deal with quantitative numbers or anything like that. There are mixed method approaches that is both qualitative and quantitative, which use anecdata, as well as purely quantitative surveys. So I want to talk a bit about those. The first and the most straightforward way of attaching numbers to this sort of data is to count things. This is a common way of doing quantitative analysis of themes. You count how many of the participants or how many of the interviews feature a particular theme. These counts are often presented as a percentage of the sample size too. So you could be talk about this theme was particularly common, this theme was a bit rare, you can compare those different the the frequency of those themes to demographic information. If you say this group of people were more likely to explain this in these terms, that can be dealt with qual quantitatively instead of just qualitatively. This comes up in quantitative surveys too. So what I mean by a quantitative survey is something which asks for like a yes no answer or something like a Likert scale, which mm -hmm. then gets a statistical analysis. Uh, look at scales, for those who don't know the term, is anything you encounter where it's like you have a statement and then you choose I strongly disagree, I disagree, I'm neutral, I agree, I strongly agree. Stuff that looks like that is a look at scale. So a survey question which asks participants if they have experienced sexual violence with a yes no answer is anecdotal data, but used for quantitative purposes rather than an exploration of the qualitative features of that experience. Counts and percentages are the most common statistics used for that sort of thing. If you're using a Likert scale, the responses are typically directly converted to numbers. This is a bit of a problem because it can encourage the misapplication of statistics by misunderstanding the relationship between the numbers and what you're actually observing. That five point scale, right? The strongly agree, agree, dis neutral, disagree, strongly disagree, right? If I have two people who both choose agree for a particular statement on that scale, 
I have no way of knowing whether they both mean precisely the same thing or that agree represents the same intensity of alignment for both. I'm pretty sure I've ranted about the problems with then applying summary statistics like means to the numbers you get out of Likert scales, but in general, let's say they are of questionable validity. <laughs> what I would say for on Likert scale is that potentially the best you can get out of it is that within a single person's response to multiple questions, it may be that a strongly agree on one question represents a greater intensity of feeling than an agree on another. You can get an ordering, I guess, within a particular person's responses. I don't know if you can directly compare two people's responses in intensity. It gets really hard. I mean, you can still do a lot with it if you assume that the ordering of the, like, I strongly agree, agree, neutral, whatever, is reasonably consistent across different people. But it frustrates me to no end to see, like, a shift in your average response from, like, 1 to 1.2 being treated as somehow meaningful. Absolutely. <laughs> Sorry, it's just not. Similar issues arise for other metrics of intensity. So if you're trying to measure pain or depression and anxiety, this is actually why a lot of psychological tools ask for frequency of something like anxious thoughts rather than intensity, because that's a lot easier to get a handle on. So you'll see, you'll have a statement like, I have felt worthless and like there was nothing I could do to improve myself. And you'll see like, I never, I sometimes, I, I never feel this, I rarely feel this, I sometimes, I frequently, or, or I often feel this and I always feel this. So that is similar to a Likert scale in that it's a scale, but it's looking at something that's more measurable as frequency rather than intensity. So when, when it comes to this sort of thing, like, the, the these psychological tools are trying to get a measure on how bad somebody's mental illness is by seeing how frequently these things occur. And that's quite a different way of measuring something than asking how intensely the fe they are feeling something. Right. Okay. Yeah. 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 So like when you're looking at pain, that can be particularly hard because there is no way to measure the pain that somebody's experiencing from the outside. And it is devastating to have to deal with in chronic pain. Like it literally rewires the way your brain works, it seems. Admittedly, medicine as a whole hasn't really been willing to deal with that sort of difficulty head on. So doctors tend to dismiss pain, uh, particularly for women and people of color, rather than try to wrangle institutionally with the fact that it's hard to measure. Mm -hmm. So this is a very real example of the impact of disregarding anecdotal data because it's hard and uncertain. And I think overall, we have to do better than that. We can do better than that. Uh, it helps to have resources to do better than that with. But overall, like this stuff can be improved and understanding what anecdotal data is and what it's valid to use for is the foundation of that. Absolutely. I just wanted to say, um, I know I, I always talk about being the arts partisan on here and talk about like novels and stuff, but <laughs> like I do think that in the kind of Marxist jargon of it, the empirical and the subjective kind of form a non-antagonistic contradiction, which can lead to some interesting results if you follow it through to a kind of like end point. I also think there's value in believing in some bullshit. And uh, <laughs> as long as it's not like harmful or in an ideological project. Like, well, uh, I, I fundamentally believe in fairness and equality and the value of human life. Those are not objective, but they are useful. Yeah, for sure. All right. That is an episode. But thank you so much for listening to me again. Thanks as ever for having me on. And I will see you next time. I will see you then.